So good evening, all. Um, we are delighted to welcome you here tonight to hear our special guest speaker, Dr. Steve Tinney. Dr. Tinney is Deputy Director and Chief Curator of the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. He is also Clark Research Associate Professor of Assyriology in the Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations at the University of Pennsylvania. He is also Director of the Pennsylvania Sumerian Dictionary Project and a leader in the field of digital humanities. He is renowned for founding ORAC, the open, richly annotated cuneiform corpus, which is one of the major digital library applications in the field of Near Eastern studies. Recently, um, he served as a coordinating curator of the Penn Museum's signature new Middle East galleries, which opened on April 21st of this year. Dr. Tinney holds a BA in Assyriology from Cambridge University and a PhD in Assyriology from the University of Michigan. He reads Sumerian and Akkadian, the two oldest written languages in the world, and is a specialist in the literature, mythology, and intellectual history of Mesopotamia. Tonight, he is speaking to us on myths from the dawn of civilization, from the ground to the museum gallery. Um, let's all welcome Dr. Tinney. Well, uh, thank you very much, Karen, for that very kind introduction. Thank you all for coming. It's great to be here. Great to see a room full of people eagerly waiting to hear about myth. Um, there's going to be a lot of myth in this talk. I'm not going to tell a lot of mythical stories, some, um, because I'm going to take fairly seriously Karen's request that I talk about the way that mythology gets translated into a set of galleries. So first, uh, where are we? Um, this is modern Iraq, and my specialty is the study of essentially the ancient Middle East, but my core research language is a language called Sumerian, as Karen mentioned, and that was spoken in the south of Iraq. Um, written texts start about 3500 BCE. The language probably dies out around 2000 BCE, but it continues in use in scribal culture for another 2000 years. So it's a language with about a three and a half millennium documented history. It's an interesting language because it's what we call an isolate. That is, it has no relatives living or dead. So one of the main ways we understand Sumerian is through translations into the Akkadian language, which is in the Semitic language family, like Hebrew and Arabic and Aramaic. Uh, but one of the things that we've really tried to do with the dictionary project is change that so that we start to look more at the way that words are used in Sumerian contexts and understand Sumerian more from the inside out. It's a tall order, um, but that's what we try to do. So <coughs> this is Mesopotamia here. On the left, the Euphrates. On the right, the Tigris. Mesopotamia means between the rivers. It's a Greek name for the place. Uh, there's lots of geographic terms that the ancient peoples used in this area. Uh, down here is Sumer, these place names, Ur will come up in the talk, Lagash a little bit, Nippur, um, Babylon, which for me as a southern Iraqi specialist, uh, Babylon is already in the north of South Mesopotamia. But then right up here, very important things from Assyria, especially uh, reliefs from Nimrud that have been in the news lately in the Christie's auction where one sold for over $30 million. You may have seen that in the news. Um, and this is just to show that in the third millennium, which is part of what I'm talking about, uh, the ancient Gulf Coast was a lot further north and west than it is now. And in fact, this, the current coast and Phylica, the island, emerged around 2000 BCE. So for the early part of what I study, places like Ur and Uruk and Blagash are essentially coastal towns. And that has an impact on their trade relationships and a little bit on the mythology, as I may bring out. There's a lot that I could say, as you can imagine, this evening. I'm going to sort of, or this afternoon, I'm going to pick and choose as we go along. So this is a cuneiform tablet. Okay. Um, as you can see, writing is very densely packed. This is basically a typical Sumerian literary tablet 
from the site of Nippur, where the Penn Museum excavated a bunch of scribal schools in the late 19th century and the first excavations that were carried out by the US in the ancient Middle East. And they were very lucky because they found, uh, we don't even know exactly how many tablets, 50, 60, 80,000, the estimates vary. But one of the things that they found in these scribal schools were the residual documentation of people learning Sumerian around 1730 or so BCE. And we know that date because we have administrative texts that are dated from this period, and they kind of taper off and die out after I think the latest dated text is 1723 BCE. So we're pretty sure when this comes from. It's after the death of Sumerian as a spoken language, but this is the Sumerian literary corpus. And when we talk about Sumerian myth, we're really talking about this snapshot of texts from about 1730 BCE, give or take. Here's another cuneiform tablet. Um, to most of my colleagues, this looks just the same as the last one, and it may look just the same as the last one to you. It is a different tablet, I promise. It's a different myth. Um, the first one was actually a myth about Inanna, the goddess of uh, war and sexual love, carnal love. And this is a text about the gods uh, Enki and Inhorsang. Um, one of the problems that I had in the gallery process was that I wanted to put a lot of tablets in the galleries, as you can imagine, and all of my colleagues, and there were nine of them, were like, we've got enough tablets, they all look the same. Right? I said, no, no, this one looks different, look how it looks different. Um, so I'm not gonna show a lot of pictures of tablets, for that reason, um, but we'll come to how they articulate within the mythology a bit more later. And this is one view of the gallery. So the galleries overall um, plot a course from village life through the development of early cities and then big focus on the city of Ur and then working through to the near Assyrian period, the first millennium and even Islamic material. What we're looking at here is sort of the first of our stops on myth in the gallery. At the end of the hall here, this is the material from a temple, the temple of uh, Ninhursang, from about 24, 2500 BC. Up here is roughly what we think it looked like. A lot of occupation in that period was on little bits of land that were appearing out of the marshes. Southern Iraq is very marshy in this period. We call them turtlebacks. So we sort of faked the edges here. There's not a lot of occupation. And this stuff here is the decoration in the temple that was excavated by Sir Leonard Woolley in the 20s. Um, Woolley actually thought it was a temple facade, but we know now from rereading the stratigraphy that it's probably a collapsed bunch of material that they put in a room on the side. It's internal decoration to the gallery. So one of the, the challenges in this early period is a period when we don't have many mythological texts. So we have to sort of you know, navigate that with some sensitivity. I'm gonna show this slide again in a moment, but I'm gonna show you a few things that are along here. Unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of the interesting stuff. Everybody takes pictures of the fancy stuff. And up here, there's an image which I'll explain in a moment. This is one of the objects in that area. This is a seal impression. Seals are small cylinders of semi-precious stone which are carved, in this case, with incredible detail because this actual object is only, this, this is rolled on clay to make this impression. It's an ancient rolling. We don't have the seal itself, okay? But the actual rolling is only about three inches wide, or two and a half inches wide by a couple inches high. So the carving on this is incredibly fine and detailed. Um, I'm gonna show you a drawing of it by an actual artist so you can understand it. It's actually a fantastic image. We have very few images of gods. Most of the ones we have are on seals. But this is from Nippur, and it's probably from about 2300 BC, 2200 BC, and it shows probably, it's not labeled, but it must be the pantheon of gods in Nippur. And it ties in to some of the core mythology of ancient Sumer. Because up here, this character here, who's looking a bit glum, um, is probably Enlil, the chief god of the city. Okay, and beside Enlil is probably Ninlil, his spouse, and then a pair of deities here, one sitting on a throne and the other on the lap. We have very few images of deities sitting on the lap. We don't know exactly who these are. Uh, in fact, I disagree with one of uh, Karen and my mutual friends. Uh, Holly is convinced this is male, which it could be, but I'm not so sure. But the interesting part mythologically is the lower register. 
because with the lower register, we actually finally have myth. And if we understand the texts, we can interpret this, because this character here is carrying something, right? And what it is, is a big mace for attacking people, or attacking monsters. And can you see what he's carrying over his shoulder? Anybody? No? Quiet crowd? It's a severed head, right? He's carrying some kind of monstrous head over his shoulder. And he's surrounded by these human, upper-bodied, like ostrich-legged figures, right? And there's some other device here. And I think this must be a reference to the god Ninurta. Ninurta is the warrior son of Enlil. And one of the things that Ninurta does is defeats enemies of the state, defeats enemies of the god. And he actually becomes a reference to the king when the king is defeating enemies of the human state as well. There's a number of myths when, when Inurta, uh, attack is, is responding to a threat. For example, uh, there's a, a demon that lives in the mountains. I, I'm going to use the word demon, uh, although Karen is very sensitive about it. Uh, um, a demon who lives in the mountains, the Arsag, and the Arsag gathers an army of stones, and Inurta has to defeat the army of stones and Arsag, and at one point he tears a mountain out of the ground to use as a club against this army. And then he decrees the fates of all the stones, those who were on his side or didn't fight against him get good fates, and those who fought against him get ground up and made into powder, that kind of thing, right? And in these various Inurta myths, there are references to his chariot, and his chariot is hung with the monsters he's defeated, like the six-headed sheep and stuff like this, right? So I think that here we have a visual representation of Ninurta returning to Nippur after one of his conquests, carrying this severed head over his shoulder. So we made a lot of this because we wanted to say something about gods and the pantheon, and we're short of images. Um, so this is one of the design illustrations, not a gallery shot, showing how this is laid out. We put the upper register right up on top, above the gallery, so that as soon as people walked into that corner, they got a sense of God sitting around at home on their thrones. And then we have the actual object here, which is really very difficult to read with the naked eye. And then underneath it, we had this big drawing so that people could actually see what was going on. And then down here, we've got our usual, typical 50-word label or whatever it is. Uh, one of the great joys and or frustrations of working on a gallery is that you have no words to say anything. You know, if you're lucky, you get 50 words. Um, later on, I'm going to show you how we tell the story of Gilgamesh in 50 words. It's not, not pretty. Um, and we also put in that area this text. This is informally called the Barton Cylinder. It's a text that we have at Penn. Um, we're not exactly sure where it's from. It was brought back to Penn by the excavators who dug at Nippur in the 1880s, 1890s. But because of the way some of the signs are written, we don't actually think it comes from Nippur. But it's very, very interesting because it's a very, very early myth about Enlil, who was the god in the previous image, and Ninhursang. And Ninhursang is the goddess who's in the temple, right? So it connects with that. It's hard to tell the story. The text is very broken. It's very early Sumerian. But somehow Enlil and Ninhursang procreate and there's some kind of threat, and there's discussion of a warrior god. So somehow this all ties in. It's through a glass darkly, right? We don't understand what's going on, but we can see snatches of it. Yeah? And by the way, personal note, this discolored fragment was disconnected from the main object, and I found it in the collection. But I didn't join it, because I didn't know what it was. I was working through a little box of fragments reconstructing a hymn from about 1800 BCE, and I put them all together, and I had this piece left over. And I sort of looked at it puzzled. I started walking around the place that I work, which we call the tablet room, because we have 25,000 clay tablets there. And there was a guy there called Antoine Cavigneau who took one look at it, and he said, could it be the Barton Cylinder? Went over and got the thing and slotted it right in. That's the kind of jigsaw puzzle that sometimes it's fun to do when you work with the originals. And here's another one that I, you know, a lot, this early part of the talk is to some extent about uh, things we can't figure out very easily. I love this object. It's also in that part of the gallery I showed you. Um, basically, know who this is. It, 
this is a figure called Anzu, probably, or a kind of an Anzu representation. Anzu is a lion-headed eagle, and he's on the back of a bull, of a human-headed bull, right? Lots of hybrids in Mesopotamian mythology. Um, and he's, the bull doesn't seem to be very unhappy with it. I don't know whether he's eating parasites off the bull or if the bull's just, you know, not quite figured out what's going on yet. Um, but this figure with the bull with the beard, some people connect it with a sun god. And you can see down here, one, two, three, three little humps and three wedges or three humps in earlier script, three circles in the very earlier script is in fact the cuneiform sign Kur, Sumerian sign Kur, mountain. And the image of the sun god, the word for the sun, the sign for the sun, sorry, is the, there's a, an, a loop like this and then a circle over it, which is the sun rising between the mountains. And it's very similar to this loop. And a lot of people associate this with the sun god, some kind of sun god mythology. I frankly don't understand it. Um, if somebody figures it out, let me know. And here are those things in situ. Um, on the left is where the Barton cylinder is and the seal impression, and above it, the pantheon of gods, and that is that little Anzu plaque that I just showed you. So in the very early period of Mesopotamian mythology, we have sort of a sense of what's going on. I'm talking about really the third millennium BCE, the 3000 to 2000, but we don't have a lot of contemporary documents that give us extensive myths. We have a couple, but they're difficult to understand. And things change a lot, and we get much better understood towards the end of the third millennium and into the second millennium. So I'm going to focus for quite a lot of the talk now, most of the rest of the talk, on this corner. <coughs> this room, I'll show one shot from it later. This room is basically dedicated to the city of Ur. Ur was a tremendously important city in ancient times. Uh, it's tremendously important archaeologically, because when uh, Leonard Woolley excavated there in the 20s and 30s, he found what is essentially Mesopotamia's Tutankhamun. That is, he found what he called the royal tombs of Ur, which were full of golden objects and various other things and exciting things like mass burials, which I'll talk about a bit more in, in a minute. Um, and around in this corner, this is where we have most of the written materials in this area, where we get into myth a bit more. And this object is a very interesting one and one of my favorites. Uh, there was a lot of controversy over whether to include this for two reasons. One is that it's not the original object. The original object was that size and that shape. And what this is, is basically a 3D printing of all of the pieces of the object reconstructed in such a way that we can see what the original object looked like. And the reason we did that is because when it was, re when it was put together in the, the early 30s, late 30s, uh, it was put together in such a way that we could see there was something wrong. When we took it apart, we realized that some of the pieces of stone didn't actually belong to the monument, and that the person who put it together had actually shaved the stone in a few places to make it look better. And the, it, it's attributed to a king called Ornama. Ornama was the first king of a major dynasty of Ur, about 2100. But the only piece of the stone that mentions Ornama's name is a different piece of stone different kind of stone, sorry, from everything else in this monument. So we felt, firstly, we couldn't put it back together. And then secondly, over time, the stone has been deteriorating. It's been delaminating, as we say, so the surfaces are becoming unstable. And this gallery is a 25-year gallery. Our conservators said, you know, you can't put that up for 25 years because the face will just fall off the monument. And obviously, we didn't want that to happen, right? But we wanted it in there. I wanted it in there. There's a number of us who did, a number of us who didn't. Um, because it tells a really, really interesting story about mythology associated with kingship and temple building. And we have a very good understanding of that mythology from a long text that is not in the US, it's in the Louvre, Gudea Cylinders. Um, the reason some people didn't want it is because it's big, it takes a lot of real estate. But that was another reason why I wanted it, because part of this is about creating monumental environments that are supposed to overpower people by their sheer size and presence. And it's very hard to create an image of big monumental objects with small things, right? You have to have something big in the gallery. So this is big. And you can just see there that corner, 
I have other images of him in a minute. That is the one piece of the original that we have, and it's this piece here. I mean, we have all the other pieces, the one piece in the gallery, and it's this piece here, and it tells a really important story. So there's that piece. Um, this is essentially a cartoon, okay? And I'm gonna show you more scenes from it so you get a better sense of that. It's in what we call registers. So there's a register above this line. This is one register here. There's another register down here. And we know from Gudea's cylinders basically what's going on here and from other artifacts in the gallery, which I'll show you. So this figure sitting on this nice throne, this is a god. Gods usually have horns. And if you go back to, see if it goes well enough, yeah. Go back to here. You see in this earlier document, this is two, 250 years earlier, all of these gods have these single pairs of horns. That's marking their divinity. Here, this is several rows of concentric horns, very tightly packed. This is the god Nana. Nana is the moon god, and he's the chief god of Ur. Okay? This character here is the king. This is King Urnama. Okay? Assuming this is Urnama's stele, which we still do for reasons I won't, uh, frankly, bore you with right now. And this base is what you're looking at here. These are the feet of Nana. And these feet and this body, these are the feet and the body of Ornama. And what this tells in the several registers is the story about how the god calls the king to build the temple. We tell this story in several ways in the gallery. We hint at it in what is actually a small animation, a minute and a half, two minute animation, which is a fly through of Ur. And it includes a reference to the monumental architecture. And there is the stele on the platform that the excavator thought that it originally belonged on. We're not quite sure. But you know, we took some shots in this gallery because we wanted to recreate something, make people understand a bit about it. And this is the ziggurat of Ur. And here's the other side. You see we reproduce the ziggurat up here and this. And we put these things in relation so that you can read them a little bit. And we have this little kiosk here which tells the full story. I'm not gonna tell, show you every single panel from it. There's another piece of the sight line with the reproduction and the original. And there's the reverse. And you can see, I don't go into this detail in detail later, this is actually people playing some kind of a kettle drum. And this guy here has a whisk, and this is a part of the god, and he's cleaning the god. We know from texts that the Deity, the actual god that you worship, lives in the statue. And we know from the texts that each day you have to wake the god up and wash the god and dress the god and then bring them their first breakfast. And the way it works is that you put the food in front of them and you take it away and the people who work in the temple actually eat it. And then they rest for a little while because it's exhausting stuff being a god, right? And then you give them their second breakfast and again, you show it to them, and then you take it away, and people eat it. They have an afternoon nap, because what, do you do, or what else do you do in the afternoon, right? And then they get their first dinner, and again, they see it, and it gets eaten by the temple personnel, and their second dinner, and then you put them to bed again, right? So that's the life of a god. But they actually can roam around. They go to rituals, and they travel. When, the, when Gudea is rebuilding the temple, the god who lives then in Girsu actually goes down to stay with another god, Enki while well, his house is being redone, just like you or I would, right? Um, so he's looking after the statue, and up here they're actually slaughtering animals. This side is a whole banquet and ritual festival. I'm gonna show you a few scenes from the AV, or at least the brief of the AV. Um, those of you who are in the class tomorrow will see other scenes from it. I didn't want to reproduce everything. Um, so it starts with this mock-up of the whole thing, and you can touch it in various places, right? And here's the line drawing of the very top of what we call the front, for sake of a better name. And these are, this is actually the, the pages that were the instructions, the briefs, to the people creating the AV. And I thought I'd use them because it's a bit of variety. Um, and this is the very simple text. Nana, chief god of Ur, 
instructs King Ornama to build his temple at Ur. And we're pretty sure this is what's happening because of the other scenes that follow, and because in Gudea, uh, Gudea actually lies down in the temple and incubates a dream, and the god Ningirsu appears to him in this dream in the form of Anzu. He's terrifying. He's the lion head and the eagle wings is the upper part, and the flood is his lower part, and he gives Gudea a message that he doesn't understand, and Gudea has to go to his mommy to have it interpreted, interpreted because that's how things work with dreams in ancient Sumer. Nobody understands the dream that they receive. They always go to their, either a, a goddess or their mother to have them interpreted. And you can see there are these flying figures here with flowing vases, and this is Nana, and he's got somebody sitting on his lap. We're pretty sure of that because although it's not all preserved, her feet are very clearly preserved, and we have other pieces of steely's monuments that show these things. So we get a sense of you know, how this works. And this is Onama, maybe with a towel over his arm, approaching the god and probably getting the call to build the temple. And here's the next register. This is the one that's really well preserved that you just saw, right? This is, this is the middle of the piece you just saw. This is the legs and lower body that I said were the feet of the king. And this is really interesting because it tells you something about the way that they interact with both the god and the goddess. And this is essentially a panorama. So in the temples, very early temples only have one sanctum sanctorum, one in a shrine. But as they get more complicated, they develop temples with two shrines clearly for the main god and the spouse. And what this is showing is Gudea, uh, sorry, Ornama, sorry, Ornama. Ornama on the left, on the right here, with a date palm altar, he's pouring a libation to it. And this is the god that you saw with the crown, Nana. And what he's holding is a measuring rod and a rope. And this adds here, right? And on the left-hand side, there's an attendant behind Ornama here. And that attendant is reflected behind. And here's Onama again, pouring another offering in the date palm altar, this time to Ningal, Nana's spouse. And Ningal is greeting him in the customary way, um, which in Sumerian is called kirishungal, to place your hand to your nose. It's not to thumb your nose at. That's quite different. That's the standard greeting in Sumerian. Right? And again, very simple caption, because a lot of what happens in the gallery is not quite at a glance, but it's designed, you know, if you have an AV like this, an audiovisual like this, people look at, you don't want them to stand in front of it for 10 minutes. You want them to be able to get out of it in two or three minutes what you want to get out of it. So there's both an amount of translation and some control of the conversation. The king meets Nana and Ningal, the divine couple of the city. So there's another thing, you know, we can put more in the audiovisual. This is one of the uh, artist's renderings that you saw early on with the, uh, the uh, seal impression. And here's the lower register. And this is where it gets really interesting for me, because this is where you really connect with the mythology. Okay? So you have this setup when the god calls the king to build the temple. And then the king has to do a bunch of things. He has to you know, make offerings and clear the site and so forth. He has to be physically involved in building the temple. And that's what's being shown here. This is Unama again. This is usually said to be Nana, but I don't believe that. Because Nana shouldn't be walking in front of him, in my opinion, and making this salutation gesture. I think this is the personal god of the king. And it's a current frustration of mine that, to my knowledge, we do not know the name of Unama's personal god. We know Gudea's. Gudea's personal god is Ningishdira, but we don't know Unama's. But I think that's what this must be. And he's making this Kirishungal gesture, this greeting gesture. So he's introducing Onama to the task at hand, and behind him, look what he's got over his shoulder. He's got the ads that Nana was holding, okay? And here, balancing on it, this strange triangle here with the dots, this is actually uh, a basket. It's a work basket, okay? And it's not just a work basket, it's the work basket. It's the work basket the king uses to carry the clay. I'm gonna show you this in a moment to make the first brick, okay? So this connects, this I'm sure is wrong down here. This, must, this figure must be standing. Um, so this is where the building comes in, right? This is the king up above. And then we have all these fragments. See, this is an ordinary worker carrying a work basket and it's piled with clay on top. And they're building these walls. They've got ladders, which are fragmentary, but this is 
an actual genuine piece of the steely, so we can, you know, uh, interpolate from that. There's a ladder there. This seems to be the cellar doorway. Um, so it's connected with building. So this is, it's, it, we put the pieces together in a fairly sketchy way with the NAMA, but we fill them out with Gudea. So there's lots of ritual in this building process. And this is a lovely little figure, uh, later than Ornama and Gudea. This is a king, and again, he's making this salutation gesture, the Kirishungao, and he's carrying some kind of a goat or sheep, young lamb. I have to be very careful here, because what we usually say in our field is he's carrying a kid, but when we say kid, we don't mean child, because the purpose of the kid is to be sacrificed. Right? This is divination. And this occurs in Gudea. Every time he has to do something, he does some divination. He does that because it's a bit like that phone commercial. You know, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? He's checkpointing with the gods that he's doing the right thing because it's tremendously important in the magic and the ritual and the religion and the mythology that things be done in the appropriate, the true, the, the pure, the proper way. Um, so the way this works is that when he's prepared the site, he takes one of these omens, and the, way, and the way the omens work is that you kill the young animal, and then you open it up, and you inspect the liver. And they actually call, <coughs> in the mythology, they call the liver the tablet of the gods. And they say to the gods when they conduct the omen, when I conduct this omen, I want you to write in it that this is good, and this is good, and this is good, so that you give me a positive answer. <coughs> and it's possible to get negative answers, or um, uh, equivocal answers. And in that case, you can actually do the uh, omen taking again, but you can't proceed. So there's a series of points when Gudea does this, and this is illustrated. And um, just by the by, this base here makes it look a little like this plaque might be a plaque of a statue of a king holding the sacrificial animal. And you can tell they're kings, by the way. They all have these little roll woolen, rolled up brim woolen caps. <coughs> and here is. Shulgi, Ornama's son, okay, it's right there, Shulgi, you can read it. Um, and this is a kind of figure that we call a foundation deposit figure. And he's in this very characteristic pose, he's holding his work basket, because he's the king making the first brick. And we know that this brick is called the brick of fate, it's the heart of the temple. So this is kind of a mythologization of how the temple works. And this thing beside it, these figures, which has an, the figure has an inscription on there that you can just about see on the body, these figures are usually buried with a brick. It's a stone brick. People often call it a stone tablet, but it's flat on one side and it's convex on the other side. And this is a reference probably to a very specific early type of brick that was commonly used in institutional buildings. And these stone tablets, the stone bricks, are probably imitations of the brick of fate. So we can see all of this, then in Gudea, once he's completed the temple and Ningyasu, the god, comes back, you have a big banquet and lots of good things accrue to the land. Right? It's very important to do these things because the king is the most important human, he's kind of a lightning rod. If the gods like the king, everything's good. If the gods don't like the king, you might as well forget it. Yeah? So, we're going to change topics in a moment. I will just say that this tradition of the Brick of Fate goes right down to the second century BCE. We have very late ritual tablets from the Greek period in Mesopotamia, and we have one which describes the ritual. It's very broken, the ritual for building a temple, rebuilding a temple. And it says the priest has to get up at dawn and take a silver saw and go to the Brick of Fate and cut the Brick of Fate out of the temple and take it over to the side and put it behind a veil, and they have to sing lamentations in front of the brick the whole time, the brick of fate, the whole time while they're rebuilding the temple. So in a sense, the temple is living through this brick of fate ritual. So, I'm gonna move to Gilgamesh now, which is a bit more traditionally mythological, right? Um, try as I may, I could only get about 60 or 80 tablets into the gallery, out of about 1,300 objects. Um, and most of them are in this wall, 
and over here, I'm not going to talk about that very much right now. Uh, if you want to ask a question about it, that's fine. This is about how they learn to write Sumerian. But over here, this is about literature and mythology and history and intellectual history and all those good things. <coughs> and where it starts is with Gilgamesh. Okay? So this is a tablet of a story called Gilgamesh and Huawa. Yeah, Huawa is the legitimate guardian of the cedar forest, but he's also Gilgamesh's first victim. And it's, well, maybe not first victim. Gilgamesh has a lot of victims. Uh, Gilgamesh's, uh, Gilgamesh's major victim in the, in the, in the uh, late epic, at least. Gilgamesh and Huawa is really interesting because it gives us an insight into the intellectual background of part of the Gilgamesh mindset. Uh, one of the Gilgamesh and Huawa stories starts with Gilgamesh going up on the walls of Uruk and looking over the walls, seeing the dead bodies floating in the river. And he gets depressed. And his friend Enkidu says, Gilgamesh, why are you depressed? And he says, oh, because I went up on the battlements and saw the dead bodies floating down the river, and I thought, what is the point of it all? I mean, it's almost literally what the Sumerian says. And Enkidu says, well, the point of it all is, you're a king, you should go out and beat somebody up and put up a monument about it and make sure your name lives forever. That's the solution to being depressed about the pointlessness of life. And so their solution is to put together an army and go and attack Huawa in his nice uh, forest environment where he's been put there by Enlil to look after it. And they kill him and they actually bring down a lot of grief on them from the, on them from the gods because it's clear that killing him was an act of sacrilege. Okay? Now this tablet is written in Sumerian, and it's from this big collection of Sumerian mythology I was talking about earlier, from the 1730 collection of material. Um, one of the very, very important pieces we have at Penn, although you wouldn't believe it, well, you might, um, is this. This is a tablet called, well, called Gilgamesh P for Philadelphia. There's a very similar tablet called Gilgamesh Y for Yale, and it's clear that the two tablets form part of a collection of tablets that wrote an extensive version of the Gilgamesh story, maybe the earliest form of the Gilgamesh epic. They date to a little bit after the Sumerian versions, probably about 1600 BCE. Uh, it was purchased in Iraq by the excavators. Uh, we think it's probably from a city called Sippar, and it's translated from Sumerian into Akkadian. So this is a time when they're taking a subset of Sumerian mythology and they're reworking it into different forms. And one of the interesting things about recent research on that material is it looks like relatively few people are doing that. A couple of families maybe know this stuff and are translating it. It's a very narrow thread. There's an old idea that the stream of tradition is this big bore sort of running down through the millennia and it just carries itself on. But that's not how we see things these days. We really think the knowledge is transmitted in these very tenuous ways um, and sometimes barely survives. What's important about this tablet is it tells us about the later version in an indirect way. Because at the very end here, this is Dub Tukam, the second tablet of the Gilgamesh epic. And what we learn from this is what the first line of the Gilgamesh epic was, because it's badly damaged here. Uh, you can either believe me or not, it is possible to read this if you're a specialist. You get the lights on it and tip it. Uh, cuneiform is three-dimensional, so it really helps to move it around in the light, and you can catch wedges that you can't see in a photograph like this. But what it says is it's the second tablet of Shutur Eli Shari, greater than other kings. And this is very useful for us because greater than other kings is something like line 25 of the Epic of Gilgamesh, as some of you may have read it in something like the Penguin Classics, Andrew George's translation. So we know how Gilgamesh was changed by one particular editor sometime between 1600 and uh, maybe 700 BCE. It's a big window. Most people think around 1200, but there's no real, really good evidence for that. So I'm going to tell the story of Gilgamesh uh, twice. Now, I'm going to tell it once the way I like to tell it. I'm going to tell it the way it's told in the gallery. You can see which one you prefer. So this is a nice reconstruction of the city of Uruk. Uruk's an important city in Mesopotamian history and their own way of thinking about their own history. They themselves believed writing was 
invented at Uruk. Uh, the earliest tablets that we have seem to be from Uruk, archaic tablets that we can't really read the language of, um, but which we can interpret to some level. We can see that some of them are uh, recipes for beer, perhaps, and some of them are lists of slaves, captured slaves, and so forth. We're starting to get a handle on it. We can't prove they're in Sumerian, although almost everybody in the field thinks they are. So Gilgamesh begins in Uruk. And this is an image of Shamash, which I'm going to use to tell the very first part of Gilgamesh, which is that Gilgamesh is in the city of Uruk, and this is after the hymns of praise, which we'll come back to later, and he's basically oppressing the citizens. He likes to play games with the men of the city, and he's wearing them out and injuring them. And he likes to exercise an, what is known as a feudal practice, where the ruler uh, has sex with the bride before her husband. It's very clear in the text that this is what's happening. There's no ambiguity about it. And the people of Uruk, what's interesting is, it's not what he's supposed to be doing. This is not a portrait of a good king, it's a portrait of an aberrant ruler, right? And the townspeople of Uruk call to the gods and they say, send us somebody who's a match for Gilgamesh. And the gods create Enkidu, who's essentially a wild animal, a humanoid wild animal. And when Enkidu is spotted in the wilderness, you know, he eats with the animals and drinks with them and so forth. When he's spotted, uh, an alert shepherd says, you know, this must be our equivalent to Gilgamesh, our, our match for Gilgamesh. And they send out a prostitute who seduces Enkidu. And after six days and seven nights, Enkidu says, okay, I'm going back to my animal friends now. Um, but his animal friends don't want him anymore. They shun him. So Shamhat, the lady, takes Enkidu into the city, and they civilize him. And in Gilgamesh, there's lots of moments where changes in the narrative are marked by changes of dress or grooming. So what they do is they shave Enkidu's wild animal hair off, and they teach him how to drink beer and eat bread, and then he becomes a proper civilized human. And then he is uh, horrified by Gilgamesh's behavior and goes to fight him in the street, and they fight essentially to a standstill. It's like one of those buddy movies, right, where the first thing that happens is the guys are at odds, and then when they realize they're kind of even, they team up and they take on the world, right? That's kind of what happens in Gilgamesh. So, cutting a few bits of the story, the, the, the action sort of segues to starting an expedition to attack Kuwawa in the mountains from the Sumerian story. The gods are involved in this. This is, takes place in a period of time where Gilgamesh's mother is a goddess, Ninsuman, and to protect, so he's two-thirds god, and to protect Gilgamesh on this expedition, Ninsuman appeals to Shamash, uh, who is shown here. This is Shamash, the sun god. And this is the sun, and the sun is being made to rise, right? This is a very nice plaque. Um, and so Ninsun intercedes with Shamash and says, please protect Gilgamesh and Enkidu on this trip. Uh, she tries to persuade them actually not to go, but Gilgamesh is absolutely convinced he has to go, and he gets together his army, and we know a little bit about what these early armies look like from monuments like this. This is another stele, much earlier than the Ornama stele. Uh, we call this the stele of the vultures. Um, it's a, a combat story about Aenatum, who's the king, He's bigger than the rest. In Sumerian, the word king is this really big man. But he has this sort of phalanx of army people, and you can probably just see they're trampling on the bodies of their enemies there. And there's all sorts of interesting written stuff, um, but that's not really the purpose of this visual. It's just to give you an idea of what Gilgamesh's army looked like. So they go off to Huawa, and they go to the Cedar Mountains, and the Cedar Forest where Huawa lives. And there's this big battle, and there's lots of drama where Gilgamesh is over, almost overcome by Huawa's auras, his, his magical qualities, and then Kidu persuades him to carry on. And eventually, they bring Huawa to the point of defeat, and there's a moment when Huawa says, you know, spare me, I'm just here, I'm supposed to be here, and Gilgamesh is almost swayed by it. And then Kidu says, like, no, we're gonna kill him, and they cut off his head. And this is a big problem, because Huawa is Enlil's guardian of the forest. So they think they're doing something good that's going to establish their name and their fame, but they're actually creating a huge problem for themselves. 
So this is Huawa. Uh, for as long as I've been teaching, I've been trying to persuade my students to go to Halloween as Huawa. I've not yet had a success. Uh, maybe you guys are more fun than Penn students. Um, we know this is Huawa. This is a very interesting piece, actually, it's in the British Museum. It's actually, um, what it is, is a set of entrails. They did divination also from entrails of animals, and we have actually collection, entire collections of clay models of entrails from some sites. Um, so the reason that this is all connected and kind of bowly is that that's what it is. But it's configured into this face. On the back in this inscription, it actually says, this is the face of Huawa. So there's no real doubt about this connection, right? So Huawa is pictured as kind of scary and demonic, but he's not really in real life. And this is another nice cylinder seal. This, I think, is widely accepted to be Huawa in the middle. And here are uh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu. Uh, I'm not entirely sure even which one is which. Karen might actually know. No? Um, but any, either way, this is probably Huawa being defeated by them. And this is the object. It's a nice image. So this is only about this big. It's a semi-precious, slightly translucent stone. There's some very interesting work being done on digitizing these things in 3D. And some of them are uh, glassy stones that you can see right through. It's very hard to digitize them because the light goes all the way through. It's a really interesting technical problem. Um, but it's a moment. And so they come back from their campaign. Another change of dress. Gilgamesh is, you know, has the gore of battle on him, but he becomes, he cleans himself and grooms himself and his beard and puts on fresh clothes, and he becomes the perfect image of a king, okay, from being this battle gory individual. And this character on the left is probably one of the earliest representations we have of a king. It's from archaic Uruk. Um, he has his headband here. So if you want to imagine what Gilgamesh looked like when he was at his finest, it was something like this. And he catches the eye of the goddess Ishtar. And Ishtar says, Gilgamesh, you're a great king, you're a handsome king, why don't you marry me? And Gilgamesh has an interesting response to this, which is not, oh great, I could marry a goddess. It's, well, look at your previous lovers, Ishtar, and how they've all failed and died, or you've cast them aside, and basically he says, you know, I'm not interested. He spurns her. And Ishtar is furious about this. And she goes to her daddy, Anne, which is something he does on a number of occasions, sort of stamps her foot and says, these guys have to die. Something has to be done about this, right? She said, and then she says, sort of an afterthought, you know, they kill Huawa, by the way. It's not really her motive, but it's in there. And so they send down the bull of heaven, the bull of Anne, which is this huge beast tromping around knocking down parts of the walls of Uruk, and Enkidu and Gilgamesh have to fight with the Bull of Heaven. And as in this seal, as you can see, they kill the Bull of Heaven. The good Toreador's uh, sword between the shoulder blades, right? And then in the Sumerian version, actually, the prior version of this, when they kill the Bull of Heaven, they actually cut out probably its genitals and throw them at Ishtar, who's standing on the battlements, and the battlements crash and Ishtar jumps away. It's tremendously dramatic and it's probably quite comedic, but we don't really get the humor of it. So after this, we have death. Because Ishtar goes back to the gods and says, okay, this is too much. You can't just let these guys get away with everything, right? So they decide that Enkidu should die, mainly because, you know, Gilgamesh is the main character in this. He can't die. Um, so Enkidu contracts an illness, and he dies, and Gilgamesh is in complete denial and sits by the body mourning until a maggot falls out of its nose. And then he finally accepts it. And when he accepts it, he goes and buries Enkidu. And it's really unfortunate this tablet is fairly badly damaged, and also that the death of Gilgamesh, the Sumerian story, is badly damaged, but we can see that in the Sumerian tale, the death of Gilgamesh, where Gilgamesh does die, they lift elements of that and they put it in the death of Enkidu. So Enkidu's burial is modeled on that story. And what's interesting about the death of Gilgamesh is it depicts Gilgamesh being put into a tomb where he takes all of his palace with him. Okay? 
So they actually divert the Euphrates, they excavate, they build a stone tomb, and they bury Gilgamesh with his various wives and his priests, and they all go into the grave. And what's interesting about this is it brings us back to reality. And it's really hard to see how the literary history and the reality connect, but it seems like they do. Because what Woolley found at Ur in the royal tombs was mass burials. Not a lot of them, but very significant ones. Like this one, this is one of the passageways, and what they found were skeletons of oxen, and there were, there were her carts hitched to them, and they found all these soldiers that are depicted here standing up before they die, posed on the ground, okay? And it's quite likely that this is something that goes back to a notion that human kings have palaces, and when they die, they'll have a palace in the underworld, and if they need to staff the palace in the underworld, then you've got to bury your retinue with you, right? It's perfectly logical. Nobody here would object, right? Maybe some of you. So, I said earlier that this is, um, this is uh, Mesopotamian's Tutankhamun, and this particular assemblage really demonstrates that. This is the Queen Pu'abi. We have her seal, and this is her name in Sumerian, Queen Pu'abi. Um, and she's from about 24, 2500 BCE. Her chamber, tomb chamber, was almost undisturbed, or pretty well undisturbed, and most of it came to pen. So we were able to translate that into the galleries in this very uh, impressive way. This is probably her funerary gear. It weighs about 40 pounds. It's, the blue is lapis lazuli, which is semi-precious stone. The red is carnelian, which is semi-precious stone that comes from essentially Afghanistan and India. And the banded stone, the white and red, is agate, which also comes from a long way away. The gold comes from Turkey, Iran, again, a long way away. This is the riches that were coming into Ur. She's wearing the world on her, and it's being buried with her because they're so well off. And they're burying their entire palace full of people so they can have that support in the afterworld. And that's what Gilgamesh does for Enkidu. So Gilgamesh decides he doesn't want to die. He has to find the secret to immortality. This is where Gilgamesh really becomes a story about immortality, various ways of getting it. And he travels to uh, Mount Marshu. Marshu literally means twins, twin peaks, for those of you who are old enough to remember that. Um, and he goes to find the entrance to the passage that the sun goes through at night. And he's met there by the scorpion men, the scorpion man and his wife, actually, strictly speaking. And they talk to him, not quite in riddles, but they interview him and decide that he can go into this tunnel that is really what the sun goes through at night. Okay? And this, incidentally, is an image taken from the front panel of a bullheaded liar that Woolley found in one of the mass graves. You see Scorpion at the bottom. I realize it has Scorpion Man, as though everybody would know what it was. Um, we take it for granted, Scorpion bottom, person top. So Gilgamesh goes into the pitch black, and he can't see. And after the first double hour, he can't see. And the second double hour, he can see even less. The third double hour, less. And he goes on for 12 double hours through the tunnel until he comes out into Shamash's garden, the garden of the sun god, where the text says the, the trees had jewels on them. The fruits of the trees were jewels, right? Maybe a reference, actually, to the fact that they got so much precious material from the mountains of Iran. And he keeps wandering. And like any good, you know, long-range uh, adventure story or maybe post-apocalypse story, you know, how many times have you seen movies where somebody gets outside the protected zone of the city and they find some strange settlement or person living in a house on the edge of nowhere, and somehow, miraculously, Gilgamesh comes across a bar. And there's a barkeeper there. And at first, she looks at him, and he's wearing lion skins, he's covered in dust of travel, and she's like, what is this wild man? And somehow she puts it together, and she talks to him, and he says, he tells her the whole story about how Hanky Doo died, and he sat there until the maggot dropped out of his nose, and how he doesn't want to die, and he has to find the secret to survival, and he's heard there's a guy who survived the flood, and where can he find him? So the bartender, Siduri, tells him that he has to go 
to the edge of the water and find essentially the ferryman who will take him to the flood survivor. Um, irrationally, when Gilgamesh gets to the shore, he has some kind of fit of anger or something and destroys these mysterious objects that we still don't really know what they are called the stone ones that seem to be the way that, to power the boat across the water. So they have to punt. Um, and I discovered after 20 years of teaching that many people don't know what punting is. Uh, some of you have done it probably. You have a very flat boat and you have a pole. You put the boat, the pole, into the fairly shallow water, to twist it so the mud doesn't catch it and lift it out hand over hand. And when you do that, the water drips down all down you. You get wet when you're punting. And the water that they have to go across is the water of death. So Gilgamesh has to go out and cut enough punt poles to get them, in theory, all the way across. So he uses one punt pole, leaves it in place, uses another one. They run out still, so they make uh, you know, a sail out of his tunic, and they get to the other side, and they meet the flood survivor. Okay? And the flood survivor, Utnapishtim, tells the story of the flood about how the gods decided to destroy humanity, and he was warned by his protective god, Ea, who's the god of magic and saving humanity in various ways. And there's this whole build-up that explains that everything was destroyed, and essentially, for Utnapishtim, the flood survivor, to get immortality, he had to be the only survivor of this massive, massive global destruction. And when the gods realized he'd survive, they realized because he makes a sacrifice. And the gods are starving because they've killed all the people that make the offerings that they eat. So they gather, the gods gather like flies around Utnapishtim's, the flood survivor's offering, but they still are not happy he survived. So they banish him and his wife beyond the reach of civilization so that what he knows can't be part of what humanity knows. And Gilgamesh learns all this. So after being told that basically you can't get humanity, you can't get immortality unless everybody else dies, which is an unacceptable price, Gilgamesh says, oh, there must be another way. They say, well, if you can stay awake for seven nights, we'll give you the secret. And no sooner does this happen, Gilgamesh closes his eyes, he's exhausted by troubles, he falls asleep. And they bake a loaf of bread every day and leave it beside him. And the bread from the first day is moldy. The bread from the second day is dry. He wakes up, and, he's, and they say to him, ah, you fell asleep, you failed. He says, no, no, I was just resting my eyes. And they point at the bread. They say, you see, you were there for seven days sleeping. Go, right? So he's about to leave, and they give him one more chance. Gilgamesh is not very good at getting things right. They give him the secret of the plant of life, and Gilgamesh goes down and into the water and gets the plant of life. And instead of eating it, he puts it down and has a swim, falls asleep, and a snake comes along, slithers along, and eats the plant of life. And as it slithers away, it sloughs its skin. And this is the story of why snakes shed their skin. So Gilgamesh fails to get immortality, physical immortality, twice. Right? And that's when it comes back to the importance of this first line of the epic which in the early period is greater than other kings. In the later period is he who saw all. Because after this scene with the failures to get immortality, he comes back to Uruk with the boatman who's been banished by the flood survivor for taking Gilgamesh to him. And he says to him, Urshanabi is the name of the, the boatman. Um, it means actually uh, man of two thirds, which I think is a reference to Gilgamesh's divinity. Um, Gilgamesh spoke to him, to Urshanabi, Go up Urshanabi onto the wall of Uruk and walk around. Survey the foundation platform. Inspect the brickwork. See if its brickwork is not kiln-fired brick, and if the seven sages did not lay its foundations. One square mile is city, one square mile is date grove, one square mile is clay pit, half a square mile the temple of Ishtar, three square miles and a half is Uruk, its measurement. Boom! That's the last line of the epic. What? What kind of a last line is that for the Epic of Gilgamesh? This is where the prologue comes in. Because the text begins, this is the very end. There is a tablet 12, but that's a shady thing. And I agree with Andrew George, this is the original end. The very start, the bit that is just before Grid and Other Kings, is this. 
the same as he says. Go up onto the wall of Uruk, see if it's brickwork, and it stops here. It's measurement. That's the end of the epic. And it's a pointer. It's like one of those worms that eat, eats its own tail, right? The Ouroboros. It's a circle. Because right after that, it's making you think of this line. Open the tablet box of cedar. Release its clasp of bronze. Lift the lid of its secret. Pick up the tablet of lapis lazuli and read out all the misfortunes of Gilgamesh and all that he went through. So that funny ending about the measurements of Uruk is really a way of making you think about the fact that you're reading this from a tablet that Gilgamesh left in the walls. And it's telling you how you get immortality. You don't get immortality by staying awake for seven days, reading the plans of life. You get immortality by writing about what you did and leaving it for future generations to find, which, to be fair, has worked really well for him. Right? So that's one way of telling the story of Gilgamesh. Here's how I had to tell it in the galleries. You can vote on which you like better. Uh, the Gilgamesh epic is ancient Mesopotamia's most famous tale. Okay. It describes how the hero Gilgamesh and his companion Enkidu travel to the legendary cedar forest where they slay the monster Humawa. Huawa. The gods, angered by the hero's hubris, decree the death of Enkidu. Gilgamesh, grieving his friend and fearing his own coming death, journeys to the floods of Ivor and the Pishtim to obtain the secret of immortality. While he fails in this quest, he returns home to his city of Uruk, and the tablet recounting his exploits is embedded in the city walls for future generations to read. I mean, it's basically what I spent 25 minutes saying. Um, but it's not really the same, is it? So I realize I'm out of time. So I'm going to say a few words on the next few slides. We've got two or three more slides. This is another very important tablet that's in that area, which is the Flood Tale. And the Flood Tale is connected to Gilgamesh as well. The Sumerian version of the Flood story is related to the versions in the Old Testament and in various other traditions. The long version in, in Gilgamesh that is told by the Flood survivor um, and it's implicated in the birth and loss and recovery of knowledge. This is a fish man. Um, you can see, if you're good, he's got human legs here, right, and human arms, and a human face, but also a fish head and a fish body. This is actually a priest wearing a cloak, which I'm fairly sure probably was an actual fish skin. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen any of those programs on you know, extreme fishing for massive freshwater fish, you know, these 200-pound carp. It's probably something like that. And it's a reference to a myth that is told to us actually by a later writer, but we understand from various reasons that it's correct, that knowledge, they believe that knowledge of how to carry out rituals and all that important stuff was brought to humanity by a figure who swam out of the Gulf, and he had human arms and legs, in the human head, but a fishy body and head. And this figure is called Oannes, or Adapa, the sage, the first sage. And when the priests carry out their magical rituals, they're pretending they're this first sage. And in the death of Gilgamesh, one of the things they say to him when they're saying, don't be sad, Gilgamesh, is you went and you met the flood survivor and you brought back knowledge from before the flood. It's an interesting problem. If you wipe everybody else out, how does the tradition carry on? Right? And part of their answer was that Gilgamesh was involved in it. And this is my last slide. I just wanted to go out on a good slide. Um, this is in some way related to this notion of knowledge and hybrid beings and priests carrying out rituals. This is actually a genie, a divine figure. You can see, I need this again, you can see he has the horns at the top. Now, this is very similar to the one that was sold at Christie's. There's a lot of these in the U.S. They came in in the 1850s or so from Ashram Nasir Pal's palace in Nimrud. And what's interesting about this is that it brings the mythology of purification that comes from the gods and is related to preserving the body of the king right into the throne room of the Assyrian Empire. These things were put behind the throne of the king. They're actually, there's a missing sacred tree here. Another figure on the left who's pollinating what they're doing here is they have a bucket probably of pollen here, and this is a pollinator. Date palms don't self-pollinate. You have to pollinate them manually. And all the way back to the Anamastili, this is a date altar that he's pouring libations on. 
and it connects this mythology of how you can carry out rituals which bring divine purity all around you to protect you right in to where the king is ruling the empire from. So one of the things that we've tried to sort of show throughout the galleries and which I tried to bring out this evening in this talk is that there's both the mythology of stories and there's the kind of the actionable part of mythology that's tied to real life activity. And there, mercifully, I'm gonna stop, thank you. So I'm happy to take a few questions. Yeah. So for the different like materials, like whether it's the tablets or the uh, all the different types of materials that we're working with, do you all try to keep it in the different worlds that you create it in the, the obstacles? That's a very good question. So the, the question is the materials in the gallery, do we have to keep them at the same relative humidity? Are there environmental conditions that we have to observe for all of it? Um, and the answer is that in this gallery, uh, there's very little material that is sensitive in that way. There is some metal in the, in the galleries that we have to watch the humidity of, and we have some active humidity control. And then we have the galleries themselves actually go up to ethnographic collections from Central Asia, textiles, and some manuscripts. And those are really sensitive to light and really sensitive to humidity changes. So we both manage the environmental conditions in the cases, and we swap them out. The conservators only let us have them on exhibit for six months. So we had to design a 25-year rotation every six months, swapping them out. But otherwise, the stuff in these galleries is very stable. Other things, you know, Native American, Native American collections, it's almost all humidity control, temperature control. Yeah, any other questions? Yeah, please. Yeah, it's a question we've been getting a lot lately, especially since that movie. What was it? You know what I'm talking about. Is it Black Panther? Yeah. We've had all of our school kids now come into the galleries and they're like, oh, you shouldn't have that, you know. But so the ownership of objects obviously is really fundamentally uh, something that has to be discussed all the time. Um, almost everything in the Middle East galleries was excavated by University of Pennsylvania excavations with written agreements from the governments that were then the, the governments in control of the areas. And it was brought back to the US under a system that is called partage, which means division. And it was uh, the standard system until the 60s or 70s, depending on which particular country, where the, the excavating team would take a percentage of the material which was usually determined by the host country. So an agent from the antiquities department would say, yes, you can take that and that, and we'll keep this. So there was an agreed division. So almost everything in the Middle East galleries is either that, or it was purchased by people who were essentially tourists in Central Asia. So for these galleries, we don't have any of those problems, happily. Um, you know, there are other collections, the Benin bronzes and so forth, that are always gonna be subject to discussion. Uh, and the other thing that we do, uh, we're very uh, careful to comply with NAGPRA, which is the North American Graves Protections and Repatriation Act. And we actually have an entire department in the museum, which is not funded by the federal government, because it's an unfunded mandate, but we receive requests from Native American groups for the repatriation of remains and ritual objects. And then we evaluate those. Most, I think, statistically, most of the time, we agree to repatriate. But there are examples where it's not clear that the claimant is actually the original owner of the material, or maybe it's not actually a ritual object. So it's not simple, just cut and dried. But it's a really good question. Anything else? <laughs> Please. Um, I was wondering, um, from the pieces that So some of the stuff that they destroyed most publicly, you know, the, the sledgehammers uh, on the, the human-headed bulls and stuff, that's from exactly the same time period as our relief, which is right there, same palace, basically. Um, so a lot of what, it's a complicated story. They certainly did a lot of damage. The destruction was not as great as they made it out to be. 
A lot of the objects that they showed themselves destroying in the museums were actually casts of the originals. And the experts were able to look at that and say, oh, no, I've seen that thing. That's, that's not a real thing. So it was partly a propaganda exercise, but that's not to say they didn't do a lot of damage. Okay, well, in that case, I'm going to say thank you very much for coming. Spot on time. <laughs>